And I have this, so I can zoom up in, and then I have a, okay, okay, and then I have, all right, I got all my stuff, okay. Alrighty, then you're set. It's no rush, transportation and transit. Looking for a job. <laughs> Christy Gladwell, Master of Human and Selected. Jim Howell, the Title Transportation Planner and the Fleet of Water. Lenny Anderson, Project Manager of Swan Island Transportation Management Association. Andrea Allen, uh, Civil Designer of the Hawk Peterson Regalis, as well as a graduate student. Valerie Horowitz, General Manager of Container Marketing at the Port of Portland. And Zach's dad. <laughs> Jonathan Horowitz, I'm a senior in the engineering school here, and Zachary's second brother. <laughs> Third brother. Third brother. Michael Wolf, I'm a master's student in civil engineering here at PSU. Uh, Ian Coleman, architecture student at PSU and friend of Zach. <laughs> Ryan Frost, co worker, David Evans and Associates. Cameron Greil, co worker, David Evans and Associates. Alexander Moore, I'm a community developer. So we're ready. Just wait for it to go live here. Can you remind people about the market? Yeah. So if you ask a question, you need to uh, use the microphone, <laughs> touch the uh, button until the red light comes on and keep the button touched while you're asking the question so that they can hear it live on the internet. Welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. Together with uh, my transportation faculty colleagues, Dr. Fidel Filiotze, Jennifer Dill, Rob Bertini, and myself, Chris Monsier, we co-organized this Friday Transportation Seminar. We're very pleased today to have one of our soon-to-be alumni of the program, Zach Horowitz, to give a presentation today on uh, capacity alternatives for the Class 1 railroads in the Pacific Northwest. 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up, especially I see quite a contingent from the Horowitz clan and from uh, <laughs> colleagues and uh, uh, both from work as well at, at Portland State. So it's great to see so many folks interested in real issues. Um, before I start, I'd like full disclosure. Um, I'm using the black and orange theme for my uh, for the presentation slides. Those are the BNSF colors. I'm wearing the black and yellow of Union Pacific. So I actually have no association to any railroad, but for those that you know that know me, if I were to pick anything, I'd probably be a Canadian national. <laughs> I'm Canadian. So this is my outline for today. I'll go. I'll explain a little bit about how the project came into being uh, for myself um, in the intro. I'll discuss a little bit about the background of the project. Uh, we'll touch on some of the economic issues of the Portland or the Pacific Northwest, as well as uh, uh, railroad demand um, and some previous work that has been done in this area. Uh, in the geography section, I'll discuss uh, really the track layout for both uh, Union Pacific and Burlington Northern and throughout the corridor. Uh, I'll move into model development and where I'll be really concentrating on the development of the open track uh, simulation model, uh, the data that goes into it, uh, and actually walk you through a, a brief description of how I built the model. Uh, the analysis and results. I'll focus on uh, actually how I ran the model, how it was calibrated, and what kind of data outputs I was able to receive, and how that data was processed, and what my uh, what my results were. From this, I'll draw some conclusions, and I'll step into an opportunities and looking forward as to some possible uh, directions another student could take out the work. Okay. Okay. One thing I learned most about the rail project is. A lot of people are really interested in trains, and that trains have a really long history, and some of the strangest people you would think that would never be into the choo-choos um, really, really have an affinity for trains. A few of the things I learned, the track gauge, four feet, eight and a half inch. Um, it's a, sort of an unusual gauge. There are some different ones around the world. There's also some narrow gauge railways. Um, I'm not sure exactly why the gauge is, is how it is, but if you look and uh, I've read, some of the Roman roads in Europe were actually built approximately four feet eight, and when they started laying the rails, it was natural to follow where the Romans built the road. Uh, some of the inventions for railroading have been unchanged for literally 150 l or longer, um, including the flange wheel. And this is that the diameter of the wheel is about an inch or two inches wide, two inches longer on the inside of the track and keeps the train uh, attached to the rail. And th since the invention of the flange steel wheel, again, about 150 years ago, it's really um, Sonia and the baby. Um, it's it's really it's really been unchanged. Uh, in the United States, the seminal moment was um, the founding of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad B and O. From those that play Monopoly, that's the same railroad. Uh, 1827, and the B and O really was one of the first railroads, if not the first in the United States, to really sort of profitize or, uh, the idea that you could actually move passengers from city to city or you can move goods from city to city. Before then, in the United States, the majority of, of, the, of the train, which wasn't uh, too much, really had to do with, say, moving coal to power plants or uh, goods from, say, farmland to port. So the BNO really sort of commoditized, or began to commoditize at least, the, the movement of passenger and goods between cities and connected Baltimore to the Ohio River. Uh, with the signaling system, most of us, we're all familiar with the red and green of traffic signals, but do we know that 50 years before the first traffic signal for vehicles, there was actually the red and green developed in London for trains. So again, if it, make, it makes sense when you think about the history of trains being that much longer than the history of vehicles, but uh, so that's where signaling comes from. I want to know on a quick quiz, does anybody know what year the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in the United States? I knew somebody would know. 1869. You're right on. So that's a long time ago already. And of course, that was a real key in really linking the United States, fulfillment of the Manifest Destiny, et cetera. Uh, I know during uh, the late 90s, when so much fiber optic was built out, there was a lot of reference to back in the day when all so many different railroad firms were developing lines and everybody, and there was a massive build out. And this is where we can see back during World War II in 1916, um, U.S. line mileage peaked about a quarter million miles plus or minus about there. And today, we've actually lost about 100,000 miles of that track. 
it's been abandoned or turned into uh, trails or uh, just left alone. And we're down to about 142,000. And for those not familiar with Union Pacific's Bailey Yard, and mom, everybody's here. Okay. For those not familiar with UP Bailey Yard, I would encourage you to go to Google Maps or Live Maps and take a look at North Platte, Nebraska, and take a look at this yard. It's the largest rail classification yard, also known as the Hump Yard uh, in Nebraska. And it's the largest one in the world, and it's absolutely amazing. In fact, actually, to go to the maps and take a look at rail lines anywhere, say throughout Oregon, you really learn a lot about the history and geography of a state or of a place by following where the tracks go and what cities it connected. And it's actually quite a different picture than where, say, I-5 goes. Looking at the project genesis, um, this is my master's project for, for PSU and sort of the culmination of my master's program here, which is nice to finally get towards the end. I was looking, I was planning on going to the private sector and I was doing, planning on doing sort of consulting projects, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, so I wanted to do a project that was a little bit more project consulty rather than something that was a strictly academic exercise. And my dad gave me an idea from some of the work that the Port of Portland had done with HDR uh, back in 2005, looking at this directional running concept, which is what my project was about. Uh, so he put me in touch with some folks there, and I did a number of interviews. I learned a little bit about the background. Of, of railroading in the Northwest, about the project in general, uh, again, railroads in general. From that, I sort of decided it was something that would be appropriate for the project. I went through uh, sort of um, like an analysis and an examination of different railroad simulation software. For example, a lot of the ones that the railroads use, they're very expensive and they're proprietary, and I didn't really see myself in the office of a rail firm actually doing the work on their machines. So I wanted something that I can run on a home computer. And this led me to OpenTrack. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, I couldn't find too many programs in the United States that actually did rail simulation. Uh, I had to turn towards our, our European counterparts. And um, this OpenTrack was developed at the Swiss Institute of Technology in Switzerland. And it really had a set of f a feature set and ease of use um, and, and a learning curve that was reasonable enough to uh, develop my project and to, and to use it um, to get my results. And from all this, I worked with Dr. Monsier to develop an appropriate scope for the size of the project and, and move forward. All right. So what are we talking about? Really, we're looking at the Columbia River corridor. And this is from the area, really from the Portland-Vancouver area. Again, now I'm speaking in, in uh, rail terminology. So Portland-Vancouver, those are their terminals. Their east, east terminals are Pasco in Washington and Hinkle in Oregon. Um, we know the Columbia River separates Washington and Oregon. On the north bank uh, is the Burlington Northern uh, Railroad. Uh, originally built by the Sp Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railroad just about 100 years ago. Uh, it's referred to in rail terminology as the Fall Bridge sub subdivision, which runs between Vancouver and Pasco. Uh, on the Oregon side, uh, the majority of the rail was built, uh, the majority of the currently UP line was built uh, from the Oregon Railway Navigation Company in the 1880s. Uh, but there were even a few sections around the Dalles that were built by the Oregon Steed Navigation in 1863. So it's actually a much older line. Uh, I think you could probably assume that the engineers at the time had a choice between either bank, there was no track there, and chose um, the more advantageous southern, southern route. Uh, that's referred to now as the Portland subdivision and goes from the Portland terminal area out towards Hinkle. Uh, switching gears for a second, talk a little bit about uh, the economy in the Portland, uh, which I've heard a number of lectures about from my pop. Um, we're heavily dependent on trade and transportation. One of the most often cited statistics about uh, both the Portland region as well as the larger uh, Pacific Northwest is one in seven jobs are devoted or are related to some aspect of trade or transportation. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the Oregon and Washington history uh, and still, and still uh, main major business of agriculture and natural resources. We export a lot of wheat um, or other uh, natural materials um, uh, to the Far East and also bring in quite a bit of finished goods from there. Uh, naturally, um, ports and railroads are a big part of the transportation infrastructure here for shipping these type of goods. And sort of underlying everything is the growth that we've seen in the last 20 years and that are projected now for you know, the next 25, 30 years. Um, so all these trends are expected to continue. 
So speaking specifically towards uh, railroad demand, uh, and this, these estimates come from a number of different sort of uh, papers that have been produced by the port associations, business associations, are uh, really sort of looking at uh, you know the business climate in the future. Uh, so they're forecasting about a 60% growth in overall demand uh, in the next 30 years. Uh, it's broken down into individual segments based on the type of car load that the trains are carrying, uh, intermodal, and these are really talking about container ships, or sorry, containers that have been brought on ships from the Far East uh, to the United States and now are being loaded onto rail cars and trains and shipped to Chicago and points on the East Coast. Those grew at about 3.5%, so that's the fastest growing, well, it's not as fast as passengers, but it's the fastest growing large segment of the of freight rail. Uh, other segments are bulk, and we spoke about this, uh, this is agriculture and mineral goods, lumber, uh, general merchandise, those are growing about 2.5%. Uh, autos is a strong area for growth for the railroads. Uh, these are referring to uh, foreign made, Japanese, Korean primarily uh, vehicles that have been shipped over on specialized ships uh, carrying just four cars. Um, most of them going to Terminal 4, the Toyota Terminal, or up in uh, the Port of Vancouver. And those are loaded onto specialized uh, Auto Max uh, rail cars and again shipped towards uh, other markets in the, cent in the center and east part of the United States. And then passenger growth is also quite a, uh, quite a bit of growth in the uh, I-5 corridor. By the way, I'll take questions at the end, but feel free to stop me if you have a question on something I've talked about. So this is a schematic of the Portland Railway Network. I'll point out a few important uh, areas. Um, looking at the Columbia Gorge, sort of in yellow there. Uh, the blue lines represent uh, tracks owned by BNSF. The red uh, tracks owned by Union Pacific. Uh, the gorge is an area I'm main, um, mainly focusing on between the Portland-Vancouver Terminal and Hinkle and Pasco. Uh, you can also see the uh, I-5 alignment, again, from the Portland-Vancouver area to Auburn and Everett. You say, well, why there's no Tacoma on there, or why is there no Seattle? Well, they're important cities, but again, in railroad geography, Auburn is where the Stampede Line travels or begins its eastward journey, and Everett is where the Stevens Pass Line begins its eastward journey. Um, so those are the two, there's three main lines for Burlington Northern in Washington, uh, Stevens and Stampede Pass. in, in uh, sort of in the central part of the state, and the Columbia Gorge route uh, along the river. And those uh, have their terminals at Portland and Spokane. And the Union Pacific has their main line in Oregon along the river, as I mentioned. They also have lines going south to California. Um, actually, one thing that's on there somewhere in the middle of the gorge is sort of the, uh, the trunk line, the Oregon trunk line, uh, also a UP line. Um, so, okay. So we have increase in railroad demand and a growing population and employment, and there's some issues now with the network in the sense of its ability to sort of handle some of this additional traffic, both today as well as project into the future. So I mentioned Stevens Pass, the most northerly line, is running 123 capacity. We say, how is that possible? 100% capacity. Well, there are certain times during the day or on certain days when there really is a lot of cargo that the railroads can set up their network to really sort of push extra trains through, in this case, 23% more trains. But there's, what happens on either side of the day or either side of, say, a three-day period is really you have sort of less capacity there. So effectively, 123 capacity over capacity, just like what we could be talking about for a bridge or for a highway project. Uh, the Stampede Tunnel is running at 60% capacity. So you say, well, why not just add trains there? Well, it's not so simple. Stampede Tunnel is a seven-mile-long tunnel, uh, has a grade, slight up, upward grade as it travels east, well, seven miles is a long tunnel, even for a train that sometimes can average, say, 10,000 feet or 9,000 feet. Um, part of the issue is the hot gas expelled by the locomotives require mechanical venting. So really, these gigantic fans help blow the smoke out through one side of the tunnel, really limiting capacity through the tunnel to about one train an hour. There's limitations there. In addition, a number of tunnels, and really, again, with rail, it only takes one tunnel, have ceilings that are too low to accommodate double-stacked intermodal cars. Well, that's where the growth is, again, 3.5%. Well, there's no point to run these trains with only one car. They are running them, but they're not as utilized as they could be, really just half as utilized. And this is now sending the trains to Stevens Pass or uh, south towards, uh, towards Portland 
and then out along the gorge. Uh, also, just north of here in, in Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver terminal itself is a, is a capacity constraint, a bottleneck in the sense of all trains that are passing through it must actually go through the yard rather than going on a bypass track. Now, this, uh, these constraints have been identified, of course, by the railroads, and they are making, um, they have proposed solutions, you know, raising the tunnel limit on Stampede Pass, for example, or put, building a bypass for Vancouver. And in the gorge, they're running about 70% percent capacity. So again, there's a little bit room to grow, but with 60% extra demand, it's going to get tight. In Oregon, uh, there's a number of issues with the Portland Terminal. Um, I'll go into those in a second. And along the Columbia Gorge, uh, that line is running about 65% capacity. So again, not fully uh, built out in that sense, but, but close. As I said, the railroads are very interested in looking at this area, again, building on the demand. Um, and they propose any number of solutions. So the Vancouver Yard Bypass, I spoke about that. Uh, one thing that can always be done, since trains are excel themselves getting longer in order to move mo more cargo with the same number of locomotives, uh, they've been talking about increasing sidings. Now, if you've looked at the alignment for BN, it travels very close to the gorge in some areas, and there's wind surfers out in certain parts that don't aren't interested in extra siding length, because that is the best wind surfing area in the world. Um, and it's a national scenic area, so there's environmental constraints. And again, building track is very expensive, so the railroads want to make sure they're getting a good return on their investment. Um, something else that could be done, uh, double tracking certain segments, and this is really having a side-by-side -side track. So double track in some way, you can uh, sort of think about it as a very long siding in some area. Um, there's new connections that can be done. There's some in the Portland Terminal where trains actually have to back up in order to access track. Um, there's Si or there's turnouts, uh, basically curves, uh, where the trains are limited to 10 or 15 miles an hour. Uh, that's a c capacity constraint. So out of all these solutions that have been looked at, uh, one of the things that have been proposed to really solve a lot of problems or to sort of ignore some of the other issues but really so look at the capacity is this concept of directional running, which is the idea now taking the gorge, taking the BN and the UP, which are two bi-directional, uh, lines and using them, uh, combining the infrastructure to operate them as a one-way couplet, much as what they've been talked about with Burnside and Cooch. So instead of two two-way lines, you now have one, you have two one one-way, uh, either operating clockwise or counterclockwise, really forming a loop around the gorge. And that's sort of, I said, oh, what a great idea. Let's take a look. Uh, well, this itself doesn't come without challenges. So one of, the most, one of the biggest challenges is actually getting these fierce competitors to cooperate. And I sort of thought, as I was like, what's a good way of explaining sort of the, comp the competitive fire between BN and UP? And I thought about it, and I thought a good sports analogy, a good baseball analogy would work, and maybe those guys are sort of like the Red Sox and the Yankees. Is that they'll trade players, they'll work together, you know, for the good of the whole, uh, you know, for all the baseball, but really, at the end of it, they just want to beat the other guy. And again, these railroad firms have a hundred plus year history and they're really, uh, you know, they have cooperated. It's not unheard of. Um, but to overcome some of the institutional challenges in the, in the, two, uh, in the two firms is actually quite a big challenge. Um, looking at the capacity of the terminals, Portland, for example, and the overall network, it would no, be no good to institute directional operations to increase capacity, say, twofold, 200%, if the terminals were maxed out. All of a sudden, you'd have all these trains arriving at the terminals with no ability for the terminals to process the trains and route them, or for, for that matter, for the port facilities. Um, combining two, ra two railroads, uh, infrastructure and communication is a challenge. Um, the day-to-day -day manage is a challenge. Can you imagine a derailment? And BN says, well, you were in charge. And UP says, well, you were in charge. So that's it. That's a that's a concern. Uh, as I said, to develop it, you really need a loop. Um, one uh, thing that has been proposed as part of the Port, Port, the Port of Portland study is to build a new bridge uh, near Boardman, Oregon. Well, bridges are very expensive, and there's lots of uh, issues doing that. Uh, but since the ports, both the Port of Portland, Port of Vancouver, as well as Seattle and Tacoma, have a big interest in improving railroad operations because it improves their core business. They're quite, um, there's a possibility for public-private partnerships, for state funds, federal funds. Otherwise, railroads are usually on their own as private companies to build their own infrastructure. But this, because there is public interest, um, 
really has sort of the opportunity to, uh, you know, for everybody to work together. And fi finally, uh, a big challenge is a regulatory approval. Uh, any directional operations would require approval of the Surface Transportation Board, uh, both the Federal Railroad Administration as well as ODOT and WASHDOT uh, organizations. So again, that's another, uh, another hurdle to step through. All right, my favorite part, the geography. Is there any questions up to now? Jim. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how how would it affect uh, uh, future passenger service in the board if you want to have stops in, in the uh, locations? Well, that actually is a big challenge. Um, part of the issue with that is with and we're talking Amtrak service here is uh, the locations of the Vancouver station primarily um, uh, being is or Amtrak would be concerned that if they were forced to say travel west. I'm not exactly sure if it was west or east on one of the lines, they wouldn't necessarily be able to drop their passengers off in the same area, as well as changing some of the routing. So passenger service is a concern. And of course, the freight railroads are in the business of making money. Passenger service sort of is a is a um, is a capacity constraint for them as well. So th certainly a challenge. Okay, I have the big map here. All right, so this is a map I got from the Portland study. Um, and I'd just like to point out a few sort of important areas for both uh, Uni uh, Union Pacific and uh, Burlington Northern. I think I've zoomed in too far. All right. Okay. So in terms of the Union Pacific uh, network in, in Portland, uh, they have two main, two main lines. The... Uh, the Graham Line here, which follows Sullivan's Gulch, an ancient or a long time uh, transportation corridor long before I-84, the railroad was there. Um, as well as the Kent Line, which follows Columbia Boulevard, excuse me, Columbia Boulevard follows the Kent Line. Um, again, let's not forget who was here first. Uh, the Albany Yard is the yard, we all see it down at Swan Island, right by uh, I-405, off the bluffs, and the Barnes Yard up north. Uh, terminal 4, the big Toyota terminal, very interesting place, and some very important businesses out of Terminal 5, including Columbia Green, major, uh, uh, the, the major uh, offload facility. Um, and last, uh, well, there's a Peninsula Tunnel, which uh, goes underneath uh, through St. John's, north from Albany Yard, up to the Peninsula Junction, this sort of big interchange up there. That's one of the capacity areas uh, where trains are restricted to about 10 or 15 miles to that area. Uh, Union Pacific has uh, trackage rights on the BN line up to Seattle and to access the uh, Columbia River Bridge and then the Seattle subdivision, which is the BN main line up to, uh, up to that area. Uh, they go through the North Portland Junction. Uh, for the Burlington Northern, they have their uh, main yards uh, along the Willamette River and Highway uh, US 30 uh, down here at the Lake Yards, uh, Wilbridge Yard. They cross, the, the line goes north across the Willamette on the first bridge uh, built in the Portland area in 1908, rebuilt in 1989, but uh, I think at the time it was the longest swing, stand, swing span bridge in the entire world. Um, and they go through the St. John's Cut, the big sort of gash in, the, uh, in that part of, the, of town, uh, through the North Portland Junction across the swing span bridge over the Columbia River, and then uh, the Vancouver Yard is an important, is the big terminal um, in Vancouver for the BN. And they have their two lines, the Seattle subdivision and then the Fallbridge subdivision, which goes out east. Oops. All right. Did I get everything here? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Okay. So that's Portland, Vancouver. Now let's look a little bit about the larger gorge. Uh, the pink area is the National Scenic Area, so there's a lot of environmental issues uh, with improving capacity through there. Um, all, all these show you the length and uh, name of the sidings. And then you see out sort of on the east area uh, towards the Midwest through the Blue Mountain Route and then up to Spokane and, and the Pasco Terminal for, uh, for BN. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, geography through this area. So on the South Bank, the Union Pacific, it's 150 miles studied as part of my model. Uh, the average grade is just under 0.2%, so pretty flat. Again, if you're a railroad engineer back in the day, 
you're building your tracks along the river. It's the most gentle grade, and every time you add a locomotive, they're very expensive, and um, you want it as flat as possible. Uh, for, uh, naturally, 48% of the track actually is zero grade. Um, between the Portland and Hinkle area, there's 130 feet ev elevation gain, but it's not all straight up. The UP line is quite, is quite hilly, so it goes, there's up and down sections. 42% uh, of the track uh, is curved, 58% is flat or tangent, uh, and the curvature ranges from 8 minutes to about 6 degrees, 36 minutes. The majority of the track is less than 2.5 degrees. Again, you're a railroad engineer, you want to build it flat, you want to build it straight. Uh, the 13 sidings studied um, 60, from about 6,300 feet to almost 13,000 feet. I think the shortest one is Bridal Veil. Vale. The largest one is something called Wyeth, I believe, which is right before Hood River. It's right. Uh, near the Dalles, there's about 22 miles of double track. So this is uh, something that had been identified a long time ago and um, increased. And the, my simulation stops at near Boardman, which is at milepost 165. So the BN network is a little bit longer. It's 167 miles. So grade the yes. Real quick, can you explain what a siding is? Sure. Uh, here, I actually got to. You're going to have me skip ahead, but that's a siding. So at the top area is your main track. You can imagine that's a long string, and a siding is a little second mini track, maybe again depending on the size, where a train can pull onto the, onto the siding to have another train pass each other. You're very welcome. Okay. So it's a little bit steeper. The uh, Burlington Northern is a little bit steeper, uh, just under 0.3%, uh, a, a little bit straighter, and a little bit flatter. But unlike the UP, which is hilly, uh, BN, as you travel east from Vancouver, only increases in, in uh, elevation. And it, does, it increases in much shorter, uh, much shorter areas. And this is mostly, uh, mostly further east. Uh, there's 12 sidings along. Uh, there's 12 sidings along the BN, from 7,000 to 11,000 feet. Mary Hill is the shortest siding. Bingen is the longest at that time, and there's a little bit, about five miles of double track east of Vancouver before it goes down to the single track. And my simulation boundary out there is uh, Whitcomb, which is uh, sort of, um, at mile post 174. All right, so now into open track. So as I mentioned, it was developed in the mid-90s uh, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich um, by two fellows, uh, primarily Dr. Daniel Erlimann. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Danny. I tried to get him to listen from Switzerland. I think he's out of town. Uh, as well as a fellow named Andrew Nash, who I think did a lot of the programming. It really takes three, the simulation, like most rail simulations, really takes three main types of data. Infrastructure, which is the track data, stations, uh, curves, Sidings. Uh, the rolling stock, which is sort of a fancy word for the locomotives and the actual trains, and timetable ta time data, which is the schedule. Uh, it uses the standard Windows interface. It's actually also available for Macintosh. Uh, but when I say Windows interface, it has file, edit, it has pull down menus, and it's very sort of familiar uh, to, you know, to all of us using computers. I use something called deterministic routing, the idea that when you run the simulation multiple times, it'll give you roughly almost exactly the same result, as opposed to using uh, a stochastic method that uh, you can develop it with seeds, where you're actually going to have a different starting point, and you may have different results. Uh, it provides animation. It's not actually all that fancy. Uh, it's just really sort of boxes moving on the line, uh, but you can watch it. And uh, there's multiple data outputs. Actually, one of the nicest things about this was the uh, text files that were output were extremely easy to import into Excel for further processing. And some of the other outputs, and I'll show you some of those, are uh, some of them graphical plot objects. So there's quite actually quite a bit of information you can get out. It's, I use it for freight. It can also be used for passenger rail. And there's a whole set of uh, measures of effectiveness for passenger rail that aren't necessarily applicable to freight. Measures of effectiveness. Most of these, uh, all of these actually apply to the line capacity of, of, of the tracks I was looking at. Um, there's other uh, measures that train uh, 
uh, firms use. Uh, these are the ones I use. Uh, one of the more important ones is something referred to as the delay ratio. And there's two types of delay ratio, a stop delay and a total delay. And you can think of the delay ratio as the, for the stop delay. The amount of time a train is stopped divided by the total amount of time, uh, the total trip time. So if it took, for example, if we can imagine it took you an hour to go somewhere, but 10% of the time you were actually completely stopping traffic. So you were, there were 10 minutes of stopping traffic divided by 50 minutes of, of actual moving time. So your ratio of time you'd be delayed, 20%. Total delay includes not only the time the train is at speed zero, but also the time it takes the train to slow down and speed up back to the, um, and, sorry, the time it takes the train to decelerate to a stop and to reaccelerate back to its previous running speed. It may not seem like it's that much different, but if you think about an 8,000 foot train moving at 50 miles an hour, it takes quite a long time to stop and certainly a long time to get going, especially if the train has to stop or start on a grade. So in this case, total delay always larger than stop delay, and it's the metric that I've used. Um, other metrics, total runtime, and this is the sum of all the train, um, I, all the train schedules summed up over uh, every, sorry, it's the sum of all, all train, uh, individual train routes summed up over each, for each railroad. Uh, you can also, I'm also looking at average delay per train, and that's uh, measured uh, in minutes. So out of all the total delay, how many, sec how many minutes each train is delayed, uh, which is divided by the total number of trains, uh, average train speed, and train throughput, exactly how many trains are moving on the line as uh, another measure of capacity. All right, track data. I will show you something very interesting. All right, railroads have their interesting ways of displaying information. If you can imagine, there's quite a bit, a lot of, there's quite a lot of information to describe a track. This is one page, uh, I think it's probably about 10 miles worth, yeah. 10 miles for Union Pacific, and from this, even though it may look like all Goop, there's lots of information you can get out of this. Um, some of that is, you can get the curvature of the track, and you can get the grade, uh, also the mile post, the location of signals, uh, yeah, yeah. speed limits, uh, the location of sidings, the location of double track, so chock full of information. And I had a series of those for both uh, for both railroads, uh, maybe 20 pages worth, covering you know a couple hundred miles. So it was necessary to take all this information and put it into a spreadsheet, so then I can build the track network. Yes, sir. Well, right, one of the things that is noted on the track, on the track charts are the type of signal control. There's centralized traffic control. So if you imagine these for U Union Pacific, there's folks in Omaha sitting in front of computer screens monitoring the whole track. There's also things called automatic block signaling as well as other types of track. And those are noted on the track, uh, on the track charts. Uh, it was noted in my work and I made sure to confirm uh, with Dr. Erlimon that OpenTrack is able to handle the North American signal system. Good question. All right, so I have all this. Oh, one of the most important things. So this, yes, is there another question? Yes. I'm curious whether uh, the amount of, about the amount of cargo, is it, are these single loaded or double loaded? Or does it, did you take that into account? For the intermodals? For your analysis. I'll get to the trains in just actually a few slides. Okay. And then hopefully that'll, that'll rise another question. Okay, <laughs> my simulations from Switzerland, they use the metric system there. We don't. Those tracks are not done in the metric system. I had to build my spreadsheet and convert everything to metric. Though, one thing that was great is that the open track actually could produce results in U.S. customer units. So data had to work in, but coming out, it was, uh, it was much simpler to deal with. But it, that was just uh, certainly another extra step. Okay. So for the model, I took this data out of the track charts and it had to sort of relate to the model infrastructure. So this is an, ex oops, hold on a second, there we go. Uh, okay. On the right hand side uh, is the tool palette. This is familiar with uh, users of Photoshop, et cetera. And we're looking at the worksheet 
for open track. Now this is just like a tiny little corner. It's really like this long thing, all the tracks. All those small little areas here are called verte uh, vertexes, vertices, and they sort of represent every time uh, an actual segment of track changes. So I had to create one of those every time a grade change or a speed limit change, or the track went from tangent, straight track, to curve track, or when a curve track actually changes its degree of curvature. I think total for both of those, there were like 1,400 of them. So quite a number of changes. Um, each of the vertices are connected with an edge, which represents a track segment. Uh, you see sort of st uh, stations. They're not really used. They were used mostly for data output, as well as sort of uh, some control functions inside the model. Um, you see some of the sidings. There's also uh, lots of ability to add, um, you know, to add text so I can identify uh, you know, which line I'm looking at. Also, since the, I, could, I couldn't only make the worksheet so big, the line had to sort of snake back and forth, so I had to make sure that I had my east and west going in the right direction. Um, so that was, uh, it was fairly straightforward. The instruction manual for the, uh, for the software was pretty good, so it was easy to follow along. After I built the model, again, representative of the tr actual track network, um, I have to put in routing data. Now, this is actually not where the trains are going. It's just to build the ability for the model to handle where the trains are going. There are three levels of routing data. Routes, which really correspond to a block length, which is the distance between two signals. Uh, and that's, that's the, main control, um, the main control piece for, for, for railroads. Uh, paths, which actually don't correspond to anything in the real world. It's just a data structure. And itineraries, which correspond to really where the trains are going to go. You know, you can send a train from Pasco to the Port of Portland or from Hinkle to uh, the Port of Vancouver. So uh, what, the way you did it, really, so you're looking at signal A, uh, you can have the model um, sort of follow along to the next signal. So I'd create, in this case, two routes. I need one from signal A to signal B for a train that may be continuing on the main line. And I also need one from signal A to signal C for train that might be using uh, the siding. And you can see, based on the, uh, where the signal head is, which way, uh, east or west, uh, which uh, direction of traffic the, the uh, signals are controlling. For westbound traffic, you also have to do the same thing. I'd have a route from, from, B, to, from, uh, sorry, from B to A. And if you can imagine, further off to the right, you'd have a signal D. I could build an itinerary that would go from signal A to signal B to signal D, etc. All right, now the fun stuff. Everything, everybody liked about trains. They love the locomotives because they're just amazing. Uh, most railroads use multiple, uh, multiple different types of uh, locomotives for all different things. There's different powers. There's different sizes. Um, I wanted to find a representative one just for simplicity. I set it on the General Electric Evolution series, ES44AC. It uses AC traction motors. There's also ones with DC motors. Uh, this thing weighs 207 tons. So like over 400,000 pounds. Uh, it's 4,400 horsepower, 73 feet long, top speed is 75 miles an hour, carries 5,000 gallons of fuel. Um, one way of measuring locomotive uh, power is using something called a tractive effort and speed diagram. Tractive effort is uh, really the ability for a locomotive to grip the rails and to get going to pull this enormously heavy, maybe 10,000 ton or 12,000 ton train behind it. And the faster the train is going, the less power can be associated, can be applied to uh, the tractive effort. Uh, there's something called adhesion, which is, again, a measurement of how much uh, the train's uh, power can be applied to the rails. And in open track, these can be accessed, ac uh, locomotives can be built and edited through uh, the engines. Uh, for the trains, there's multiple train categories, intermodal, passenger, uh, loaded trains, and empty trains. Each of those can be given a priority. For example, if you wanted passenger trains to have more priority over freight, uh, when those two might meet, it, uh, uh, might, might be might meet opposing, uh, the, pass the, uh, the passenger train would be given the, the, the fastest path through. In my model, the empty trains out of all were given the, uh, the least uh, priority because, well, they're empty. Uh, these are from the uh, trains menu. Uh, it's basically, again, a, a big panel that you can enter your data. You can enter acceleration and braking rates, air resistance equations. There's a few different ones. I use one called the Davis equation. It's a quadratic uh, formula that's applied to, uh, to actual the air. 
and also rolling resistance. And the model uses these equations to calculate train position and distance. Oh, she left, but here was her question. Okay, uh, now it was time to put all the trains together. I had the locomotives, I had, uh, I had my train types. So this is just sort of a summary of all the different things, but these are the type of data that you need to put in. Um, I had to make an estimate of how much, how full the train was. Of course, trains aren't running 100% full. I set it on 90% full, 70%. Maybe a little bit aggressive, but uh, that's what I picked. Uh, you can see the train lengths, uh, the passenger trains are the shortest, only seven cars were about 600 feet. The longest ones uh, were their intermodals, about 7,400 feet. Um, number, I have number of empty cars, number of full cars, there's a weight associated each of those. And then you can see the train weight, again, the passenger is the smallest, only about uh, 500 tons, compared to a fully loaded grain or bulk train, 15,000 tons. So that's a lot, I don't know, three million pounds? No more than that, a lot. Um, one other thing I had to do is uh, apply something called the horsepower to ton ratio. So I mentioned the train 4,400 horsepower. If you're pulling a train uh, that weighs 4,400 tons, you have a ratio of one to one. Uh, depending on the type of train and its importance to cargo, also the valuableness of the cargo, you want a larger horsepower to ton ratio. Uh, intermodal trains are given the highest priority. I had a ratio closer to two. Uh, grain trains are uh, given generally the lowest uh, horsepower to ton ratio, uh, about one. Again, locomotives are very expensive, so railroads try and minimize their use, and they use the horsepower to ton ratio to do this. As it turns out, the grade is so flat, you can almost pull all these trains with a minimum. But I'm trying to anticipate the fact that they were continue on into a larger network and that they might need uh, additional locomotives to go through uh, hilly sections. Excuse me. All right. So remember, three types of data. Infrastructure, have, well structure, or rolling stock, check, and now the scheduling data. Uh, something, there's a data structure called the course. You're taking basically one of those train types I just showed you, and you're related to one of the itineraries I previously described. So instead of now uh, Pasco to Vancouver, it's now Pasco to Vancouver with a 90% loaded intermodal train. Uh, each of those trains uh, were given um, a speed limit assigned, uh, really just using the passenger or freight. Uh, and entry speed, trains coming from east, entering into the model, were coming in, I'd say, I think I said it something like 120 kilometers per hour, so about uh, 65 miles an hour, really almost at the limit. Trains leaving Portland, Vancouver, or leaving or entering the simulation at a much slower speed, closer to that 10 miles an hour I mentioned. Um, also give each itinerary a certain priority. For each train, uh, their priority uh, to travel along through the main line was their number one priority. Each siding was given us a, a, a lesser priority. As in, if they didn't want, to, if they didn't have to use the sidings, uh, they weren't using the sidings. Uh, in the timetable function is where I set up the dispatching and, ske dispatching and scheduling. Uh, this is when I'm saying that that uh, eastbound intermodal from Van or from Pasco to Vancouver is going to enter the model at nine in the morning. Uh, there's arrival and departures. Those are mostly used for passengers, but there's actually quite a bit to be done with freight. Uh, sorry, with the passenger trains. With the freight, it was simple. They were mostly going from one end of the model to the other. Uh, as I'm starting to run the model, I had to do some calibration. I used the uh, Amtrak Empire Builder, which runs uh, from Vancouver uh, out east. Um, I'm using the Amtrak schedule on their website. I looked at their schedule. I made an estimate of how long it stops. There's no big cities, so it's more sort of a, a depot that they're stopping at. And then I ran my simulation with just one train um, to sort of measure the difference. I found the difference about negative 1.3%. So I felt at that point my model um, sort of mimicked real life conditions actually quite well. Uh, I didn't have anything comparable for UP since there are no passenger trains there. I, since the track profile is relatively the same, again, we're talking grade and length, um, I was able to sort of make some comparisons between the two, two rail lines and it, it was, again, reasonable. Um, some information about horsepower to ton ratio is a way of calibrating it, looking at the free flow speed, again, running just one train, 41 miles an hour, also reasonable, um, and then also calibrating it to, I want to say today's conditions, conditions in 2004, looking at 30 trains per day for the VN and 26 per, trains per day for uh, Union Pacific. And then I needed, <coughs> since my uh, build scenarios take place in 2020, I needed to grow my volumes. 
uh, based on the growth rates I looked at previously and estimates from further studies, um, and also trying to maintain the east-west balance. I want to, for example, if there's six loaded uh, grain trains westbound, I want to make sure that at the end of the day, there's six loaded or six empty trains eastbound. Again, it's not exactly real life, but at some point, all those empties or all those full trains that were now are empty have to go back home. Um, using the growth rates, uh, I went from uh, the 56 trains per day total uh, today to 90 trains, a split 48, 42, uh, which is about 60% growth, and this is for 2020. And finally, yes? Um, did you get a, did you look at, I know that they're redoing the Panama Canal, did you look at how that would ultimately affect the amount of freight that's coming through the corridor? I could say definitely I did not look at the Panama Canal. <laughs> But, you know, that does have some effect on, of course, uh, demand. Yeah. Um, I can answer your question in the back by saying that the Panama Canal is unlikely to affect cargo moving through ports in the Pacific Northwest, much more likely to affect cargo moving through Southern California ports rather than P&W ports. Okay. Um, oh, some other key assumptions. Uh, based on an NCHRP report I read, the way to maximize capacity is to run your trains evenly throughout the day. As you can probably imagine, this is not what occurs in real life, but I'm having an idealized model here, so that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, at least for existing conditions, I wanted all my trains to complete their uh, model run in 24 hours. This wasn't quite possible under the conge more congested conditions under the build scenarios or the no build. Um, but even though they're all uh, leaving um, approximately uh, with the same amount of headway, I think it's reasonable to assume that the interactions between the trains in the middle of the line mimics conditions at some point during uh, a standard day. I'm assuming no service disruptions. The railroad companies would be happy to hear that this would be the case all the time, but of course it's not. Uh, another important thing is under directional running, uh, the line, uh, the path from Pasco to Vancouver is now instead of about 100, or instead of about 200 miles, I think it's a little bit closer to 240. Uh, railroad crews are limited by their union rules. They're only allowed to work, I'm not exactly sure, 10 hours or 12 hours at a time. And um, you don't want, if, and when they get to their time, the train just stops. So I, I'm assuming that the union's been worked out and everything's okay with the crew. And EOT stands for end of train device, which are the red, there's no more cabooses, which for rail fans is a real sorry state of affairs. So they now they just have a blinking red light. Um, and I guess sometimes those are not, uh, there's not enough of them. So I'm making sure that there's always one of those for the train. And, and again, another big assumption is that the tracks and terminals are able to accommodate this demand. So in spite of all these, um, in spite of all these assumptions, I'm proceeding as if they all can be uh, worked out. Yes, Jim. These 2020 assumptions? Yes. Well, I assume the 5% growth for that. So I think I'm going from, um, I'm trying to think how many trains. I think I have two trains, one, two trains today to six trains in the future. So a 300% or 200% increase. I'm not sure if that would include the Pioneer. I'm, I, can't, I can't remember if that's actually part of the estimate. Uh, yes? Well, I didn't look at uh, the I-5 alignment. Um, one thing that's really important to know about my models, I'm not looking at a lot of the interactions in the Portland-Vancouver terminal area. I'm really just sort of taking the gorge um, in isolation. It's not, of course, how uh, the railroad companies would do it, but there's, you know, there's only so much time, right? Of course, if I was doing it for the railroads, I'd be hired by the railroad. <laughs> All right, so now we're into the meat, if you can believe it. So first I um, model our existing conditions, again, 2004. Uh, even though there are some train interactions, uh, especially in the terminal areas between the two firms, I simulate them independently. My computer is six years old at home. I needed to get this done at some point. Um, and running them independently gave me a much better uh, chance of actually getting through some of the um, some of the issues I had in running a full simulation day, it also made uh, data processing easier and there were no effect because the lines are operated already independently. Uh, so it was just much easier for me. 
Uh, to do some calibration for existing, I ran a total of nine runs, four for BN, five for UP. The difference between all the runs had to do with train order. Uh, sometimes I ran like all the uh, intermodals first, and then all the passengers, then all the grain trains, you know, then all the empties. Um, of course, again, that's not realistic. I tried to play around a little bit just to see if there was too much difference, and at the end, I averaged the results. Um, the other thing I looked at between the two runs are I changed some of the adhesion profiles. There's uh, a good, a normal, and a poor. Uh, really, what you can imagine is that good would be your ultimate, your best conditions. Um, normal might be a situation where, say, there's some ice on the track, or it's been raining, and the, tra and the locomotives can't uh, grip the rails quite a bit. Uh, or maybe a poor situation is you might have wet weather as well as, say, poorly maintained track track that's you know, very slightly out of gauge, it makes a little bit of a difference. Uh, acceleration profiles really talk about the ability of the train engineer to operate the locomotive in the best possible manner at all time. Of course, not everybody's, um, you know, not everybody has, say, 30 years experience as an expert, and there's some variation in, uh, from conductors, um, uh, or I guess engineers. Uh, operating the train. So again, I try to do a few things and my results for existing are uh, average across all these. As it turned out, they didn't, partly because of the grade and maybe the locomotive assignments, uh, there wasn't really all that much difference. So again, total delay ratio, the total, um, the total delay ratio being the most important. Uh, BN had about 11%, a little over 11%, Union Pacific 8%. Now, not to say one track, one line is operating better than the other, but there's less delay based on the average runtime for Union Pacific. Um, as of uh, some time ago, uh, Washington Department of Transportation uses a measure of about 10% for sort of a moderately heavy, uh, getting close towards capacity constraint for the line. So you see UP is a little bit under that, uh, BN's a little bit over that, sort of corresponding with uh, sort of that 70%, 65% capacity ratio we saw earlier. Uh, for runtime, uh, again, some of the 30 trains for uh, BN, about 125 hours, just about 100 for Union Pacific. Uh, the delay for BN closer to about half an hour per train. For UP, 20, about 20 minutes per train. Again, not to say that every train is being delayed, say, 30 minutes. Some trains could be delayed an hour. Some trains could actually experience no delay. This is just the average across all. And then the average speed, both about, 70, uh, about 41 miles per hour. So these are fun. So this is what's referred to as a train diagram. It's really, for those familiar with uh, a space time, time diagram, it's really your X of T of graph. It's your, your location in space uh, based on time. And on the bottom axis, you see the time, the 24 hours of the day. On the, uh, the y-axis are the stations. This is for Burlington Northern in Washington. And you can identify when trains are moving, or rather, you can identify when trains are stopped by the horizontal lines, as in they've stopped, time has continued to move forward, but the train itself not moving forward. For the most part, you can see that the spacing out uh, really has sort of brought in this idealized uh, uh, travel pattern, and for the most part, trains have maintained their, um, their headways between each other. I think throughout the day, the average train would pass, say, four, three to five trains, or four to five trains uh, on its journey uh, east or west. This will be a little bit more relevant when you see actually what the ones for the no-build look like. So for no-build, also sometimes I refer to as the 2020 volume using the existing operation strategy, which is, again, each line uh, operating independently. Uh, with the growth in trains, you see uh, the delay ratio for Burlington Northern up from 11% to about 14%, so a little bit of rise, but more dramatically, the rise in the delay ratio for the Union Pacific going from 8% to about 17%. Uh, total, in terms of total runtime, they're both up about approximately the same, about you know, somewhere 75 and 80%. Uh, but on the average delay per train, you see that the Burlington Northern has now gone from 28 to 40 minutes, while the UP has gone from 18 to 44 minutes, 140% increase. Excuse me. Um, and that delay per train is immediately, it's uh, obviously uh, reflected in the delay ratio and in the, in the much uh, larger increase for Union Pacific. Yes? When you were figuring out the increase in capacity, does, you assumed there'd be more trains. Is it possible to have more cars per train? Oh, that's a good question. That is a good question. Um, 
I tried to make the existing conditions to have the trains a little bit longer and a little bit fuller to uh, account for possibly some of the longer trains. But that, in terms of capacity, you're right. Um, with, the, with the sidings as they are, uh, some of the longer trains may exceed, some trains in the future may exceed sidings that they do not exceed today. No, that's actually a good point, something that I probably could go back and, uh, and do some adjustments. Um, back to this, for the train speed, uh, because of the increase in delay, you see a little bit reduction in speed, which is a natural uh, phenomenon. All right, so again, looking at Burlington Northern, you see now the lines much closer together and a larger number of trains experience some of this horizontal, uh, horizontal, well, horizontal from the chart showing that they're stopped. In fact, you can actually see some of the trains near, uh, just past the noon hour, that while they started off with maybe a headway of say 50 minutes, for the majority of the run, they're really running a block signal apart. And um, this causes additional delay for trains moving the opposite direction because a lot of times two trains are going to be required to pass, depending on which train has stopped at the siding, which train has priority. So, much tighter. So, <laughs> after looking at this, I've now gone, yes? I've, I assign priority based on the valuableness of the cargo. Uh, I try to give passenger trains the, because uh, those are, they're uh, schedule, uh, well, they're very important cargo too. Um, I try to give passenger trains, uh, since they're on a tighter schedule, freight not necessarily as tight, to give the most priority. Uh, intermodal trains, because they are the growing part, the fastest growing part of rail freight, as well as some of the most valuable, um, a lot of times stuff in containers also is refrigerated, so there's a certain amount of time uh, that they can be on the rail. Those are given priorities, and then for the least is the empty trains. For example, uh, the Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan fills up a whole unit train, 100 cars of potash, sends it from Saskatchewan to Terminal 5, they dump it, and then the trains go back to Saskatchewan to repeat the pattern. So they're empty, so they're not making the railroad any money. Those are the trains that you want to sit on the track. But there's no Are you saying based on the trains, the railroad company's agreement with, uh, with the shippers? Right. Um, well, that's a good question. I believe there's, without, I don't know too much about that. I know that trains operate manifest trains, which are the type of trains that run on a set schedule. So those trains are running on that schedule. Um, in, a, in the case of a big shipper or a time of year where there's a particular, like say for Christmas goods and they have to get to market or there's a new fleet of cars or something, I suppose that there could be some agreements, but I didn't reflect that in my model. Okay, good questions. So I've completed the existing conditions. I've completed the no build. Uh, again, looking at the 2020 volumes with the existing operating strategy. Now I'm going to take those same volumes, 2020, using and apply the directional operation strategy. There's two of them. There's one uh, where I'm running the trains clockwise. So this means that trains are traveling west on the Union Pacific track on the south side of the Columbia, east on the BN tracks on the north side, as well as a counterclockwise operation, which is reverse, east on the Union Pacific and west on the BN. As you can imagine, well, maybe you can't imagine, but as I certainly could have imagined, the directional operating strategy shows a significant improvement in delay for the result, uh, for, the, for the two firms. Unlike the first two models where I was able to run the trains independently, these, because the trains are running together, I have to run them all at the same time. So it significantly slowed down, slowed down my computer. Um, so under no build, you saw the BN with about 14% delay ratio. Now under um, <coughs> directional operation, about 5%, which is even actually lower than existing conditions. And most remarkably, the Union Pacific dropping from 17% to just under 2.5%. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I main, uh, BN is a little bit higher in this case is because I maintain the passenger service on the north side. Again, this was a constraint brought up by the freight rail as to, say, a reason why they didn't want to use directional operations. 
Um, but I said, you know what, it's going to work out. So I maintained the eastbound movement of the passenger trains on the north side. And you, you can figure also maybe in the future where passenger rail becomes far more important, uh, this may be a service that actually has a lot more priority than, say, freight. Um, both BN and UP saw a significant decrease in overall runtime. And again, this is a comparison back to uh, the no build. Uh, the do average delay per train significantly down, the UP most significantly down. Um, actually, that's not correct. It's not 44 minutes. I think it's something like four minutes or five minutes for the UP. So almost, for the most part, almost all trains have very little delay. And there's a subsequent increase in average train speed for both lines. All right. So this is what this looks like. This one, again, shows you the time. But instead of just for one railroad, it shows you the entire network. Of course, trains that are moving east and west are only using one half, which is why you see sort of the bottom half and the top half. And for the most part, on, um, on, on the north side, on the UP, so this clockwise, so these are the trains moving west on UP. For the most part, they maintain their headways throughout the day, and they can complete their run almost without delay. Uh, for the BN, again, this is not for the BN as much as it's on the BN tracks. Remember, both the UP and BNSF are using uh, both, uh, both sets of tracks. The lines moving bottom left to top right are the passenger trains. Those actually, as I mentioned, constitute a lot of the delay because they're actually passing other trains. Um, and for the most part, uh, the trains seem to maintain their headway. There's some areas where they get a little bit close. There's some areas where they're required to stop. Um, but overall, the amount of delay is actually quite reduced. I do, yeah. but how is that possible if they're given more priority? Yeah. That was a question I had too. So I realized this is that because of the way the model is set up, and I'm not sure if this was something that I was in error of, or maybe the model actually can't um, is unable to sort of process this is the only process that if it's within a certain block length. I can control the signals by assigning them with previous routes. So if a train enters onto an area between the siding, it's reserving the entire section of single track until the next siding. But for some reason, um, it, didn't, it, didn't, it would have to look far enough ahead, possibly as far as, uh, I think it was some of more, some more like 15,000 or 20,000 meters. So, you know, maybe about 15, you know, 12, 15 miles ahead to actually look at the passenger train. And running it, there was actually more delay when we'd have to wait for passenger trains with priority rather than having them stop. So I did a sort of a, you know, what's good for everybody is good for the one. All right. So what have we learned? So my conclusion from the directional strategy. Um, both looking at the clockwise and the counterclockwise, they appear to perform just about the same in terms of the overall delay. There were some small differences. I believe the clockwise was, uh, was a tiny bit better. But for the most part, uh, depending on how the railroads want to operate, there really wouldn't be too much difference. However, near the new bridge outside of Boardman, the clockwise strategy would perform slightly better in terms of actual congestion, congestion related to the bridge. I couldn't figure this out for a while, and then I sort of looked at it. And it really came down to sort of um, looking at conflict points. In this case, the clockwise strategy only has two conflict points. The counterclockwise strategy has three conflict points. And this is related to the BN, the fact that they actually don't have to use the new bridge because of their uh, tracks from, from the Whitcomb area, sort of the end of the model up to Pasco, they have that ability to sort of continue on that side, as well as running on the east side, sort of the east side of the Columbia River after it turns dark. So they can enter the model near the UP tracks as well as enter the model near the BN tracks. Uh, so there's a bit of an advantage uh, for the BN there. Um, using the directional strategy, uh, we were able, I was able to identify significant delay and capacity improvements. Again, measured on total delay or measure on train throughput, we're pushing the same number of trains through with less delay which means to get the same number of delay, you can maybe increase your number of trains 50%, 75%. Uh, one of the most uh, important findings uh, that I'm going to conclude is that the UP appears to benefit quite a bit more. Well, so what? Except for the BN, remember, we're going back to competitive differences. These are fierce competitors. Is BN really going to want to help their 
uh, Union Pacific, when they see that in 2020 doing nothing, they're going to be more constrained. And then under their strategy, even though that the BN would see significant improvements, they would see more improvements for the competition, which would mean less improvements for the BN. Now, these guys operate on a, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, maybe down in LA or somewhere. UP has a bit of an advantage. They want to do a bit of a project that they're not going to do because BN has an opportunity to, uh, to improve their operations better, and you're going to sort of wait sometime in the future when the railroads are going to say, hey, you help me here, and I'll, I'll get you back over here. Um, also, the fact that the BN is not really going to be using the bridge because of their track location, they may not be interested in putting money up for it, or they may be interested in putting up less money than the UP, or they may be interested in putting up the same number of dollars but not spending as much on maintenance. So a lot of issues sort of uh, come out from that. Um, and again, you know, there's some significant competitive hurdles to overcome. Some future opportunities other than the fact that what people pointed out to me today. Uh, one thing I certainly can do is to improve the model. So I submitted, along with Dr. Monsieur, my paper to TRB. I thought I had a good shot of uh, making it. Unfortunately, I didn't make it this year which is ironic because one of the reasons I did this project, as I said in the beginning, is I wanted to do sort of a project, like a real life project. Well, the feedback I got from the TRB committee said, well, this is a great project, well written and all that, but it's only useful as an academic exercise. <laughs> so I wanted to go back to improve my model. And they made a lot of comments saying, there's no, you know, you identified your assumptions in the model, but it also sort of rendered it a little bit sort of simplistic. Um, so one thing I can certainly do is to add in some of the operations in the terminal area, again, Portland, Vancouver, Pasco, Hinkle, to accommodate for some of these other issues that have been brought up, you know, do some of the issues with uh, train priority, um, as well as there's a lot of other trains. There's garbage trains that go to Arlington on the Oregon side for Metro. Uh, also maybe try out some of the other improvements that the railroads are, um, are, are planning, increased double track or improving sidings. Uh, I can make my di dispatching a little bit more realistic, actually say go out in the field and, and measure trains as they pass a certain point. Um, individually, I can look at each railroad and do some mainline uh, individual line analysis. Like, for example, I can, again, the model's built. So if I wanted to say just look at BN operations, maybe they were thinking of doing improvements that have nothing to do with the Union Pacific, is I can go through and use my model to, to, to measure some of those things. I could test line improvements. One of the big issues I noticed um, is both firms have three sidings that are too short to accommodate the larger intermodal trains today and then some of the larger uh, grain trains tomorrow. Well, Union Pacific can come back and say, well, I want to, we have money to improve one siding. Which of the three sidings, which door, do I want to improve? And I can run the model and say, if you improve siding A, you're going to see this reduction in delay. If you improve siding C, you'll see this much reduction in delay. And that might provide them um, uh, s some additional data to make their uh, management decisions. You know, one thing with modeling generally is that while it's been used extensively for highway traffic for a long time, the railroad companies have only now, in the last, say, 10 years, the last decade, really to start, uh, really started using uh, software, this type of software for, for their planning. All right, acknowledgments. I'd like to certainly thank Dr. Monsieur. He was like a, a rock for me. He Hel really helped me through uh, answering a lot of my questions, putting me in the, uh, keeping me focused, because this took about 18 months, so I really needed the academic support. Uh, Dr. Daniel Hulimon from uh, Zurich, he let me, he said, well, I can give you the software, but it's like 3,500 Swiss francs, which I don't know how much is in dollars, but whatever it was last year, it's certainly a lot less now. Well, the dollars would be more, yes. Um, so, yeah, so he actually donated, and it, it became part of um, the PSU ITS lab, their, their matching funds for their university transportation center. So it was great to contribute to that. Um, folks in the Port of Portland, my dad, uh, Anne-Marie Lundberg, who's no longer there, and Craig uh, Levi, also no longer there, uh, both met with me on multiple occasions and sort of walked me through some of the work that had been done and some of where I needed to go in the future. Carl Warren, also not at the port, um, had actually done a capacity study of Stampede Pass for his master's at University of Washington about 10 years ago, and I have a copy of his uh, paper that I really uh, leaned on heavily for a lot of questions, how to read the track charts, for example. And Bill Burgle, for those of you who know him, is an incredible guy. He works for HDR. He was uh, sort of the brains behind a lot of the studies that HDR did with the Port of Portland, 
And I had a very informative uh, couple hours with him and some follow-up emails that he helped me. But these guys were all the most important, but the most important <laughs> is Sonia and my new daughter, Avital. They were, it was tough to get this project done after the baby was born, uh, but it was all worth it. And when you see like smiles like that, it's really, it really is great. So they, they, they stuck through it. Sonia, a big thanks, sort of support, I mean, did support me for my two years or a year and a half at school. She was the major breadwinner. I did the cooking and cleaning. <laughs> so, so I couldn't have done it without them. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening. So I want to, before we start the questions, I want to remind people to use uh, the microphones at your desk. Keep Ooh. the red light lit so people on the web can hear. And people are watching on the web because some of them have already sent in questions. And one quick one I'll put out because it was asked a little while ago was about how many um, at-grade crossings were there in this system. And is that taken into account because do trains have to slow down when there's at-grade crossings? There are lots of at-grade crossings. I assume that the trains truly had priority at all the at grades and I didn't and thus did not take into account any uh, vehicular traffic. Yes. Um, first congratulations I think. Thank you. Um, I have a comment though about the next steps. You s I, I think you didn't include um, maybe including delays, the impact of delays. Because I think uh, maybe delays would affect more the single track operation than the loop operation. So I guess if there are delays, like in real life, maybe the loop operation would have even greater capacity than single track. And, and the other thing is maybe you incorporated these things, but you didn't really talk a lot about the safety constraints you need to have. I mean, the distance between trains, the, the speeds, and so on. Mm. And I assume that was complicated to model and to put into your program. So just if you can comment on, on that. Well, regarding delays, uh, one thing I didn't mention with the directional operations is it does include the sum of both train delays. Or, or sorry, it's, it includes the sum of all the, say, the BN trains operating both on the BN track and the UP track. So that should account for some of the differences between the single line I meant like random delays, like things, unexpected delays. Oh, sure, like a derailment or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, the model has the ability to do that. Um, again, for simplicity, uh, it might be interesting. For simplicity, I didn't do it, but it might be interesting to get the results from that. And remind me of your second question, please. Uh, the safety. Oh, the safety. Um, again, along with the, uh, the accurate crossings, I assume that the, day, the 24 hours model would have no safety constraints. But it certainly is an issue uh, between the two railroads working together uh, in order to sort of manage their safety, to make sure they, uh, they know what train orders are being sent out uh, for the operations, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah, mine's, my question is kind of related to his. And um, I was just, uh, you, you mentioned that the timetable is a very sort of important part of your model, and yet, like, not all trains operate on a specific timetable. Like for instance, your intermodals, they'll just they'll go hot when they're ready, right? Oh yeah, and definitely. So, um, did you did you consider it all sort of um, maybe by varying your timetable somewhat? Um, did you consider maybe b using that to test the robustness of each operational arrangement, right? So like you might. The, the impact of, say, a, a hot intermodal coming out of the Port of Portland might have more impact on one arrangement versus another, because I, I think that would be very interesting. One thing about the model is that once it's run, once it goes, it goes. There's no stopping it to, in, in, to insert a hot train, uh, a last minute thing. Uh, you actually bring up a good point. Uh, when I first started, I actually ran both intermodal trains. I think there, were, there was an eastbound and a westbound. I actually ran both of those first. There were no other trains on the line at the time. I uh, thought that the fact that the train probably could complete about half its route without any opposing freights uh, would account for, or it might account for some of the hotness, some of the priority that it normally might have. As it turns out, there really wasn't much difference in either the overall amount of delay for the sum of the trains or for the individual trains. Yes? Okay, my oh, question is, I mean, it seems like Definitely the couplet makes, you know, improves delay. I was thinking back to the assumptions about the amount of growth in rail demand. Yes. And it seems like, I'm wondering in terms of 
big, the, the the growth that you that you used does that would that take into account like how would does that take into account increases in energy prices in the coming twenty years or increases in the price of energy related to um, climate change and how would what would that expect to affect the balance between like trucking versus rail you know which way would that impact well uh, yes I'm sorry well a great question. Um, the majority of the reports where I got the growth rates from, they're not, well, some of them are from, I mean, some of them from 2004, but some of them from 2006. So I'm assuming in the reports, not assuming, I think the reports did mention um, sort of the, uh, some of the energy advantages, both for not as just rail, but also say, for barge traffic, especially if you're looking at, say, wheat um, in the Columbia River system. However, we don't really know what's happening with peak oil or some of the other uh, aspects, but certainly rare has become a lot more, uh, with the similar oil, a lot more energy efficient uh, compared to trucks for moving the bulk commodities. Um, so it's quite possible to see instead of, say, 3.5% intermodal growth or 2.5% for bulk, you might see actually 4%, 6%. In case the demand would be a lot higher. I figure being at least a little conservative, again, using the estimates um, and erring on that side, Directional running would become even more worthwhile if you had double the growth, say. So you think, that you think peak oil could cause more rail traffic? Well, I wouldn't say peak oil as much as I'd say, um, I'm hedging here, uh, as much as I'd say just the general cost of energy. Or, you know, I mean, one issue with uh, trucking, especially a lot of agricultural products, is there's an enormous um, destruction of the, uh, of the actual roadway, which costs... DOTs, so they may be interested in subsidizing rail, which increase the traffic there. So there's the future, you know, it's an empty road. We don't know exactly what's happening. But yeah, it would increase demand, I would expect. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, without doing the that, so I understand what you're coming from. All right. <laughs> okay, but, but, the major, but the major reason why I'm asking this question, because people myself, what my friends, um, have you uh, ever asked you to guess, because those are the Um, I don't know. I suppose, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I'm not really sure. It's, it's, again, with the future, I'm really trusting in, the, in these uh, sort of these expert reports that I, I looked at, and really, which were four or five of them. And I believe that, for the most part, they did try to see the future um, and look at some of the, some of the trends in railroading uh, in relation to ener energy prices, in relation to cargo, uh, as a way of, um, of making their growth estimates. Again, Anything that would place anything today that would place an additional strain on capacity would most likely be alleviated by um, by a directional running operation vis-a-vis, -vis, um, say, a no, a no build operation. Yes, ma'am. This is kind of a political issue, but it seems to me there's a good argument here for more public investment in increasing track and not make the railroads do it all themselves. Well, that's a big. That, that's a serious. Uh, that's definitely a great question. Um, the trucking industry always has something to say about that, of course. Uh, I like trucks too, uh, but the fact is, is that for the most part, and maybe for history, one way or the other, um, railroads are private. You know, they're they're private corporations, and you know, especially in today's transportation finance uh, constrained environment. Um, first of all, there's not a lot of public money for public infrastructure, let alone private infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that struck me most about this pro project uh, is the, the bridge at Boardman, again, being something that really, for the most part, primarily, you know, 95% benefit private enterprise. But because of the ports, uh, uh, public, uh, public enterprise has so much to gain by um, sort of, you know, greasing the rail, so to speak, of, of, uh, of the railroads that they might be interested in, say, through the Connect Oregon project or, or something something equivalent um, might be interested in partnering you know some part of the uh, the millions of dollars to build something like that yeah but it's a question I always ask the railroaders and I think on that sort of big question uh, that would be a good
today's seminar since we're also at about 1.30. I want to thank you very much, Zach, for sharing your work with us. Um, and I'll put in a plug for next week's seminar. We have uh, Sharon Wood Wartman, the author of the Portland Bridge book, to talk about uh, bridge stories uh, in the Portland area. So I think that should be quite interesting. Look forward to seeing you there. And thanks again, Zach. I'm not going back. All right. Thank you. Good now. Now a lot more. There you go. See where I've been hiding, keeping them out of the basement. Well done.